Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today has been described as a distinguished scientist and a humanist. He has authored more than 50 technical papers, textbooks at both graduate and undergraduate levels, but most significantly, of course, he's secretary in the Department of Defense for Research and Development. He's the scientific advisor to the defense minister. He's the head of the Defense Research Organization. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. V.K. Atria. Glad to be here. Dr. Atria, when you took over, um, you expressed anguish to the 61,000 crore uh, Defense Research and Development Organization uh, hadn't really produced anything enduring and significant. It was struggling with the LCAA, it was struggling with the battle tank, and a whole range of issues. Um, within one year, you were able to, well, barely, a little over a year, you were able to put the light uh, combat aircraft uh, in, in the air. How anguished are you still about the state of defense research in India? Anguish is not the word. You see, when I took over, the ARD was major programs had been delayed. Some would say phenomenally delayed. So my first goal was to see some of them through, and clearly LCA was one. If I have to use the word anguish, I would say it's anguished because in an r and if the maturity of the product is there, production orders is the only way to prove it. I think even with the successes we have had, the kind of production that takes place from Indian technology is insufficient. This anguishes me in some sense because what is the return for R&D? Finally, wealth for the country. The wealth can come only from industrialization. There are projects which have gone to production. I tend to think if you look at the in total amount of input put into DRDO and the production of DRDO, we run with the ratio of 1.8 to 1.9. The world ratio, I gather, is hovering around 2.4. In that sense, I am not disappointed. But for the kind of efforts put in, we should have had production somewhere 2.5, maybe the ratio would have been better. That ang still anguishes me. We've had enormous successes in, in missile technology, but what would you hold up as the other triumphs of uh, defense research in India? I think missile technology, LCA, all started sometime in mid-80s. Today, if I had to point out two of the major successes other than the missile and the LCA, is the electronic warfare system. We are really today one of the countries who can produce any electronic warfare system. In fact, also the confidence of the users on electronic warfare systems produced by us have been excellent. What are some of the elements of this? You know, thanks to the Gulf War, we've become familiar with uh, smart bombs and a whole range of uh, electronic um, warfare buzzwords. So what are some of the indigenous items that you've yes. developed? Smart bombs and ammunition, I'll call it as armament ammunition. In electronic warfare system, it is the question of monitoring the enemy's transmissions, either in the communication band or the radar band. Can you identify them? Can you localize them, find their direction, jam them if necessary? So we have done a fair amount of work for the Air Force. And in fact, that is the second success. Most of the modernization programs for the avionics have been done extremely well in India. Today, we have put uh, our mission computer in uh, Jaguar, uh, Sukhai, and so on. The Army electronic warfare system is perhaps the most massive system we have produced. I think it will be the largest electronic program. That has also been successful. Our Navy uh, is so, so successful that Navy preempts us by placing orders before even we start complete the design. So in electronic warfare systems, we have done very well. Of late, in radar technology, we have come of age. I tend to think unless we produce electronics technology, aeronautics technology, you cannot be a technology world. So I'm very happy in these two technologies India's level has gone up and certain amount of maturity has been achieved. You've also said that uh, it's unfortunate but uh, war is an inevitable consequence of contemporary, um, the contemporary world. Um, isn't that a sort of a, a pessimistic view in some ways to take? I tend to think it's a challenging view to take. Because if you look at the world over, how does technology get developed? Okay, in 21st century, the owners has shifted to biological sciences and medical sciences. 
If you look at the 20th century technology development, towards especially the second half of 20th century, the technology development has been goaded and guided by requirements in military and space. As a scientist, isn't that unfortunate? That we are driven to develop technology and the pace of technology is driven by weapons yes. of destruction? Yes. If I want to look at as a, uh, let's Philosopher. say, philosopher, Perhaps why should you do research? But the government's main job is to provide sovereignty over the country. To do that, you have to become strong. I'm not saying you have to wage wars. It's unfortunately true when you become powerful enough, you often try to flex your muscles. But the governments cannot afford to support research in a very wide area. So it's space has its own, defense has its own. So that's why I keep arguing that the technology we develop in DRDO must finally flow towards civilian application. The wealth of the country should go up. The wealth of the country cannot go up just building tanks and aircrafts. Suppose they can take that technology. Today, the VLSI technology, material science technology, communication technology, at one, one stage was because of the output of the Second World War. So in that sense, the technological efforts put in defense and space research, to some extent atomic energy research, what are some of the specific uh, spin-offs that we've had in India from uh, research in, in defense technology uh, that has transferred to civilian use? Unfortunately, not much. This is one other anguish area. We have not yet graduated converting our indigenous technology developed for defense to civilian application. Having said that, in certain areas, we have started looking at the feedback. The main area where we have just entered is the biomedical area. Like uh, it all started with Kalam Raju's tent. It was the, just the beginning. So from then on we are looking at uh, uh, bone uh, transplant, rather uh, Im implants for our carthopedics, implant for the mandibular things. We have looked at uh, some of the uh, special kits which we have developed for uh, soldiers in Siachen which we have converted to civilian application. So in the biomedical we are looking at things. On the non-biomedical side, some of the electronics things which we have developed for aeronautics and missile programs have just started finding use. Communication systems, we have made some input. But it's still a, one of the areas which I, I feel unhappy that I've been unable to gyrate it to a greater input, frankly. You're watching In Conversation with Dr. V.K. Atria, advisor to the Minister of Defense and the man behind India's defense research and development. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back. Dr. Atta, this is also sort of the era of privatization and uh, governments are retreating from most areas uh, as they have in many other parts of the world where defense is really done with private, private contractors and, and private producers. Uh, do you see that happening in India? Is that a distinct possibility? I am not convinced that the defense research in every country is being done by private agencies. That's not true. Production is certainly done by private agencies. In the American model, most of the R&D seems to get done in industries. Can India graduate to that model? In fact, I would ask the question, should India graduate to that model? I don't necessarily believe that that's the best model. You see, in America, because it has been able to attract scientists and engineers from all over the world who work in industries, has been able to rise the level of R&D in the industries. Hence, a large part of the developmental work gets done in industry. But the research, conceptualization of future systems, concept demonstration, or all either in the academic institutions or government laboratories. In India, our industry is still not reached that level. Probably it will take another couple of decades before it could go to that level. And also, do we attract foreigners, foreign scientists? Like, if you're given a choice, most of the Indian youngsters would go, like to go and work in America where technology gets generated and seeded. India, technology seeding has not been taking place. If that takes place, and industry technology grows up, then perhaps we could look at privatization. Having said that, I have often argued within myself and some senior officers, should DRDO be corporatized, allowed to build in a business model and 
make profit centers where government money is part of the money and we bid and get the contract. Perhaps we will gravitate towards that in a couple of decades. But uh, trying to emulate or mimic American model is not necessarily true. Some of the Oriental countries, the Pacific Rim countries, have, have had a chance to meet their, my counterparts there. For example, Korea, the model is exactly like Indian model. Defense research does most of the conceptualization, prototyping, in some cases limited series production. And once the major orders get placed, then and only then it goes to industry. To what degree has globalization, WTO, uh, the globalization of the economy, the flows of information impacted uh, this defense research and development? We must look at two facets. It could sometimes overwhelm us. At one stage, we were competing with only the the Soviet bloc technology, so to say. Clearly, the modern technology of electronics and micro miniaturization is much superior in the Western world. So today, our system has access to Western technology. So the kind of technology which you have to build has got to be much superior, much more cost effective. So in that sense, it's a challenge. So I keep telling my scientists, today, if you are going to compete as well as we did earlier, or as bad, Some, somebody say as bad, I'll say as good. You have to look at mind to market, if you, to, to use a word which Marshall Curry often uses. Second is cost effectiveness and quality. You cannot, the customer will not depend on, we have nothing else, so we will stick with whatever you give. So the competition has gone up. Hence, our productivity has to go, our turnover has to be. We cannot think of projects of 25 year duration, especially in electronics and as I say, 36 months, if you don't deliver, you have lost the battle. Globalization, somebody else will come, or some other private company may import the technology and develop the system and give. So challenges are plenty. We have the potential to rise to that extension, extent. I hope we do. Let's look at the, you know, the light uh, combat aircraft, which has been through a, a, a turbulent history. You know, for a, for a layperson, you wonder why we're struggling so long and so hard uh, with developing this uh, when so many uh, countries in the world quite routinely uh, manufacture and, 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 and produce aircraft. And, and, and why is it so important for us to develop our own? I'm afraid I don't agree with you here. We are not struggling at all. We have done extremely well. The mistake we did was that being Nearly the first time after 40 years trying to develop a supersonic aircraft, we went over to you know, the Lehman saying, yeah, we are going to do it in 12 to 15 years. No country has developed a new aircraft in less than 20 years. Even those countries which have built aircrafts earlier have taken 20 years. We somehow went and said we'll do it in 15 years, which we didn't do. Today, LCA has performed very well. Except for a five or six years delay, as we are predicted, LCA, I believe in its class, will be one of the best aircrafts in the world. We have done 202 flights. We have reached a supersonic speed of 1.4. 1.8 is the limit which we will do shortly. We have reached an altitude of 15 kilometers. We are flying three aircrafts. Not once we have had a problem in the air. And all the pilots, eight of them, who have said this is one of the best aircrafts to handle. It's far superior in its climb rate and others to the MIG and, in fact, Mirage. Of course, Sukhai is a different kind of aircraft. The kind of technologies which we have built in is also something astounding for the first time building an aircraft. 80% is Indian. It became 80% because of the embargo. It was only at 40, 60, we pushed it to 80. 40% composite material. That's why it's very light. A six-ton aircraft carries four-ton load. Now where it happens. Avionics, we are nearly going to make it what's called an open system architecture. So if the technology becomes obsolete, we can put in drop-in systems. We have fly-by-wire control systems, which we intended, originally wanted to develop with the U.S., but because of the embargo, we had to do it. So LLC is not struggling. We have done 200-odd flights in three years. Isn't it ironic that simultaneous to that we get uh, newspaper reports every other day of, of a MiG crash and recently the Jaguar crash? And I think the, the frequency of, of crashes and the loss of young lives would in most societies create a public outrage. But in India, sort of defense is a, is a, is a holy cow, so we don't like to talk about it and, and don't like to raise these issues. 
to what degree is the Ministry of Defense and your scientific advisor despairing uh, about this situation and what is being done about it? We are well aware of the clashes. We are sorry that there are clashes taking place. There are high-level committee reports. Indeed, there was a committee set up under Kalam to look at how the accidents could be reduced. Several of them have been impl implemented. I don't want to go in detail why the accidents happen, what can be done. Uh, we do a lot of flying for the aircrafts. But our aircrafts are also getting a little old. And uh, there is no dearth of training. And uh, Yes, with the newer induction of AG-18 and others, perhaps we would have a trade. But uh, I have been told that for the kind of mileages we put on, the flying we do, the accident road is, uh, rate is no inferior to any other place that's have taking place. Yes, accidents are happening. That we are conscious of that. We are very sorry to lose people for doing all those things. You are watching a conversation with Dr. Atreya, the man behind India's defense research and development. We'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. The nature of warfare is changing. Uh, it's now widely believed that there's going to be less conflict between states and more terrorism. In what ways uh, are we adopting our, our research and development of, of weapons to look at the changing nature of war or conflict? I tend to think whether we go for a light intensity combat or a major war. Some of the issues of both kinds of wars are identical. One is surveillance. Surveillance has to be very strong, both electronic surveillance, aircraft-based surveillance, and uh, undersea surveillance. So surveillance has been become one of the major issues in uh, DRDO research. So several of our laboratories, maybe 30 to 40 percent of my laboratories look at surveillance. So that is not going to phenomenally change. The second thing is, one need not look at only weapons of the kind of Agni and Prithvi. They are essential to make as a deterrent. We are now looking at shorter range weapons, more precise weapons, uh, weapons which could be netted, network centric, so that a broader area could be covered, weapons of area coverage. So the onus is going to shift from looking at only weapons of the, of the kind of Agni and Prithvi to surveillance, network centric, information centric. We are attacking all these three projects of fresh. At the same time, we cannot totally go away from the fact if we happen to have a war, irrespective of which kind of a war, finally it's going to be ground troops which will attack, whether it, you see in uh, Iraq uh, war and uh, all the Middle East war, finally it's the people who go with the tanks and others. So we, are, we cannot neglect that totally. Probably the priorities and onus will change from ground-centric war to netted war, aerial wars, and so on. But if India has to have the ambition which we express to be a global power in some sense to influence the global opinion making and reason, India has to have a global vision. If you have to have a global vision, you have to develop the totality of the military complements. There's, there's no getting away from it. As, a, as, as fundamentally a scientist uh, who, who happens to be working in the areas of, of uh, defense, uh, do you uh, regret that in, in some ways the scientific temper which Jawaharlal Nehru so glorified and, and recommended to India uh, is in some ways making us less human? Even wars now are you know, sort of electronic. The, you know, we've lost the, the human face-to-face -face element of combat. Uh, in combat, there are more uh, civilian casualties than there are military casualties. It's as if technology is overtaking us, our, 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 our humanity in some ways. Sometimes I worry. Sometimes I think about it, whether uh, technology is driving them to this extent. The answer is obviously yes. I also believe that technology is something like a steamroller. You cannot avoid it. Uh, ten years back, if somebody had said the cell phone culture will grow in India, I would have laughed at it. Today, it looks like as a part and parcel and uh, we can do without it. We may argue whether cell phone technology is necessary in India when there are so many poor people. But technology has a method of percolation. Whether you like it, whether you want it, it shall come. So the role you, we have to play, according to me, is what is the 
effect we should have on that technology. Technology is, I agree, double-edged sword. I can use it or abuse it. Certain modicum of wisdom is necessary to use, use it. Uh, atoms could be used for phase, atoms could be used for destruction. We wanted energy, we built uh, power stations, we started global warming. Could global warming have been prevented? Yes, if you are wise enough to look at what psychology would do. Today look at uh, genetic engineering. We can cure diseases. Perhaps in the next 25 years we will cure many diseases. But genetic engineering could be misused either by intent or accident. So there is no, no point in saying that science and technology has a negative edge, hence totally we abandoned. Are we ready to go back to bullock cartages today? No, we are not. Are we ready to even look at, to give you a trivial example, would we look at a black and white TV? We want a digital TV. We want a big TV screen, remote controlled and surrounding sounds and so on. So technology cannot be avoided. Can we use it with at least a modicum of wisdom? I don't think that's the thing. Talking wisdom, scientists are also inevitably at the higher echelons of their striving as you are, are also philosophers and, and, and sometimes men of faith. Do you believe in a God, in, 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 in an ordering of the universe beyond empirical logic? If you ask me from religious point of view, am I God believing, answer is no. But if you ask, is there a nature, something which perhaps we believe that we cannot conquer, the answer is yes. Uh, in every field, we seem to come to a kind of a shield beyond which we don't know why it happened or how it happened. Is there a power beyond? I tend to think it's meaningless arguing. I personally believe it's the God is created by man because we need something solid, something beyond us. It also makes us a little humble perhaps to recognize there is something far beyond you. So in that sense, I'm not religious, not a temple goer in the strict sense. But if somebody wants to say if God is there, I would avoid the argument. Not because of a fear, because clearly there is something which is seems to be beyond us. Whatever you want to call it, it's okay with me. Dr. Arthur, thank you very much. That's been a great privilege. Equal and great honor. Thank, thank you. you.